as soon as Lexi's connected. Hi there everybody. Um, we are now live on Facebook, so um, so let's get started. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us already. I see there's a, a number of people joining us on Facebook. So hi there, Ian. Hi there, Rob. Um, if you've got any questions as we go through, then please don't hesitate to ask um, you know, where we are. So um, drop your questions below. So I'll start off, I'll just um, introduce myself and we'll go around and, uh, and introduce ourselves together. So hi there, I'm Lexi. Hi, I'm Jill. Hi, I'm Rubia, and I'm delighted to invite along to our chat this week the lovely Alan Henderson. So I've been lucky enough to have gone on a couple of trips with Alan, so we're going to share a few of his memories today. So to start, Alan, for those who don't know you, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yep, sure. Uh, my name is Alan, and I um, have been a uh, volunteer with uh, Action Aid. Uh, for oh, how many years now? It's 2003, I think it was, when I finished university. And uh, uh, Difference Travel helped uh, organise these trips with um, Action Aid. And I uh, have uh, been on quite a few little adventures with them to different countries around the world volunteering. So it's all been quite a, uh, a rich experience. Oh, amazing. Uh, how many uh, different travel trips have you been on? Uh, can you remember? Yeah, well, uh, on the wall here, which you can't see, I've got um, a set of pictures which I um, I keep as sort of memories as well. But six so far. My first one was um, 2015 to Mozambique, where we uh, helped with the construction of a centre for survivors of violence. That was the first one, and it was such a um, a moving stimulating and rewarding experience that since then I've done one every year. Wow. So I mean, what would you say that kind of got you hooked on the experience? What was it about that first trip to Mozambique that, that really kind of got you inspired? See how relaxed I am. Uh, <laughs> well, I got a, a, um, I've been supporting children for a while now through Action Aid, and I got a message from uh, Action Aid saying, would you be interested in um, doing a project build in Mozambique, and you may be able to see get the opportunity to visit your sponsored child. So I was a bit apprehensive at first, to be honest, and the reason why is it's completely out of my comfort zone. So, um, but then I thought, it took a bit of time, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, I enjoy physical work. I work full time as an opt optometrist, so I'm sitting down testing eyes all day. And construction and, and um, building something of great value like that was was very exciting and so I thought yeah why not it still didn't take out the fear of the unknown but then when I realized when I was at the airport, airport waiting to fly out that I was going to be joining 20 odd plus people who had the same mindset as me it didn't seem to be that fearful and so it wasn't too much to be scared of traveling all the way down to Mozambique I've uh, never been that far in my life before, um, but then interacting with all the other volunteers was great. Uh, that they have become um, great friends and colleagues, you know, almost like family. You know? uh, and then the interaction with the locals, what we were doing, what it meant, and the consequent the consequences of what we were doing, it just you know, I don't think the, the term is hooked, but it was something that. I'd always had in my mind to do, but never had an outlet to be able to express it. Mm. Everybody's had these uh, opportunities where somebody knocks on the door and says, would you like to donate to X, Y, and Z? That's all well and good, but if I can work and make something and the sweat of your brow and something like that and, and do something physical and that I can see and do, that uh, ticks all the boxes up. That I like to do. It really does. Mm -hmm. And so when we started work in Mozambique, and that's when I first met Jill. Hi, Jill. Hi, Alan. <laughs> um, uh, we had bare ground, bare ground, and uh, there was just nothing in that, in that hospital ground that was um, uh, just empty. And by the end of the week, we had built foundations, 
and we're constructing walls. And um, <laughs> it's quite moving. It really is, you know. So, uh, so we uh, that plus the interactions with um, the local people who came and watched what we we're doing and uh, the singing, the dancing, the music, you know. I signed up almost straight away for for next for the next year. So that was 2016, where we went to um, Cambodia. Yes, mm -hmm. Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. And that had its all its different joys of being there as well. That's so that's why I brought. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. so, yeah, Alan, you mentioned that we first met in Mozambique, and that was the first of, of four or five trips, I think, that we've done together. Um, this, this is going to be a really difficult question, because I wouldn't know how to answer this one. Um, what's been your most memorable different travel adventure? Um, uh, yes, you're right. It is a, uh, it's a simple question, but a difficult answer. Uh, moments in uh, Mozambique would be meeting the, um, the the people who would benefit from the centre and listen to their stories. Mm. It was um, emotional. Um, and then Cambodia, when we went to that was our my first school build, and as such, um, it was busier because we were working in the school ground with children. We got off the bus, and as we were walking towards the actual school, there were lines of children <laughs> sitting all the way to the school. I remember. And, um, I, I, I'd been told by Steve beforehand that it was emotional, but I wasn't prepared for it. I had my little camera out, and I was sort of video with this. This is great. But as soon as you're uh, in that uh, atmosphere, put the camera down and just high fived all the way along. So that was just, and still remains one of my highlights. And then at the end of that, um, of that build, we uh, we went on a little uh, boat and on the river in Campot, and there were uh, fire. It was a fireflies. Fireflies, oh, yeah. And a wonderful <laughs> sunset. So I mean, and, that, and uh, so after that, Nepal was fantastic because of the interaction. Kathmandu is a busy. It's just such a city of of energy, you know. And then flying over the Himalayas. Looking out, so we've spent a lot of time in Kathmandu, and it was not what I thought it would be. A lot of dust and dirt and such like this, but it's it's an urban centre. And then after a week of doing that, we took a, chance, a flight over um, the Himalayas, and the contrast between what that was and what uh, we saw looking out of the plane. <laughs> <It's really good. laughs> um, so I'm listing all these things because you might write you you can't. Yeah. As, as one, Rwanda was beautiful as well because of the uh, the the countryside is fantastic. It is so rich. Is, am I right in saying it's a, the country of a thousand hills? That's right. It's just beautiful. And then we had the chance of um, going to see uh, and supporting the work they did with the gorillas when we went across the border into um, Uganda. And here's a little thing. Uh, when we're looking for the gorillas, the, um, the wardens go looking for them by looking for fresh droppings and so we can meet the, the groups. But one thing they don't tell you about is, due to the d diverse diet of gorillas, they have the, the most audible flatulence you can put in there. Seriously, I mean, okay. I mean, I like my vegetables. But... <laughs> so, uh, that, was, uh, that was another fascinating one as well so yeah there's many i mean and you'll have you do you'll have as many more memories as, than i will have but those moments uh embed themselves in your mind and you just can't you can't let go of those sort of things it's just yeah amazing. those those experiences and the things you see in the country but you touched on people as well so right. um what what do you think um what makes working on a community project so special? It's the, it's the interaction. Mm. There is, I mean, on that, on that first one with uh, in uh, Mozambique, there was a young lady there who came along as a volunteer. She won't mind mentioning it, Sophie. And uh, she ran across, while we were having a meeting, she ran across to some children who were just staring at her like this. It was about six or seven. And she just 
went like this, clapped her hands, moved around, moved like this, and they mimicked everything she was doing. It was such a touching little moment. Um, and then when we were sitting down talking to the uh, leaders who were uh, in the fields there learning to read and write, that was a moving moment. And we all sat, we remember, we all sat down on the rocks and um, uh, and they told us their stories. Oh, yeah. You might pause yeah. and slow down these bits because you can't. I can't separate the moment from the emotions at the time. I walked away because I was upset by it all. Um, but then one of the ladies stands up and sort of, and she says to us, "We can't imagine why on earth you would want to get on a plane, come all the way down here to build this centre, then to leave the work, come across to see us, and see how we're getting on." She couldn't imagine how. Generous, we were being, and that just you think, how can you, how can you say this? So that depth of feeling and emotion, it's it, it stays with you forever. Um, Do you remember you, you've come to Mozambique twice, haven't you? Yes, that's right. Um, well, actually, I've been there three times now. <laughs> so oh, I, was in, I went back down uh, in for. Uh, a few, a couple of years after I went, and I was working with Vision Aid at that time. I was doing some eye testing and things in Ethiopia, and I thought, what better opportunity to nip back down and go and see Carla, my sponsor child, again, but mainly to go and see the completed building, mm. the Centre for um, Survivors of Violence. And Action Aid and uh, Ida uh, very kindly dropped me off, and we saw I saw the completed building. It was not now bare ground. It was a centre with five rooms, all of which were occupied by ladies who would look after the treatment, care, and uh, financial and uh, psychological uh, requirements. You, 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 you question at the beginning there was about the community. This centre services a need. In the same way that we build um, schools and um, and libraries, they do make a difference specific to that place. Mm. Uh, but seeing them and seeing how much work they were doing, how thankful they were, it was just it, it shows you what the need is and how, with a little bit of yes money, but also blood, sweat, and tears, you can create something that lasts forever. And I, I remember showing the uh, Rubia there the um, the pictures from was it Google Earth where you can see before and then after you can see what you physically done to change the surface of the world and change people's lives. It's incredible how much difference you can make in such a short time. I think a lot of people think mm. as a volunteer yeah. you have to be out there for months or years to actually make an impact. But yeah. these groups go with there for a week and the change in that week, I mean I remember in Cambodia which was my first experience, we were there and the foundations had been started, but we were still doing a lot of clearing work. And um, I was working on the playground and it wasn't a playground, it was just an absolute mess and glass and barbed wire and fire ants all over it. <laughs> but by the end of the week, we built a a swing and rope set and we were playing on it with the kids and I'm like this is five days it was it was incredible and you know like you say you meet kindred spirits on these types of trips and they do stay with you a, a lot would you would I be right in saying it kind of changes you as a person as well Alan? it's like I remember we were talking about this it it changes your outlook on things doesn't it yeah I mean um all these things do our relationship, Ruby, our relationship started when we met in um, Cambodia, and it will continue, as with Jill and with Lexi. Um, but the yeah, outlook, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this when I got back from um, yeah, a bit more light. When I got back from uh, Cam uh, sorry Mozambique the first time, I'd seen and experienced the differences in, in, uh, in, in poverty. And uh, when I got back to the UK, the first thing I did was go to the shops, went to the supermarket, and it was very early. It was empty, apart from me. Lines and lines of food of anything you wanted, whenever you wanted it, like that. Yeah, nothing that you can't compare that with um, with places 
uh, there. But the, that contrast, and when we would travel to um, the work site in Mozambique, we pass, I remember the contrast and the, is it dichotomy, I don't know the right word, but you've got signs of poverty all around, but you're passing this huge, glamorous, gaudy looking casino that uh, is there from the builders from, from China. And you've got all that wealth and luxury sitting next to uh, something which isn't, you know. And you say, well, how can you square that circle? How do you how do you make that? And so when you get when you see images like that in your mind, it gives you a perspective, it gives you an understanding. You're thinking, right, how can that how can that be? But it is, it is the way it is. And the only way you can do that is by traveling and seeing it. You know? One experience which um, really struck a chord with me, I'll tell you about it now, but it's to do with the Vision Aid projects I, I, I've done. A couple of years ago, before I went to Rwanda, I was working in, um, in Lusaka in, in, um, in Zambia, and I did three days working in the prisons there doing the eye testing. <clears throat> You've got to be careful here. Um, it's a place where um, uh, it's overcrowded, malnutrition, disease, and everything are rife. And we were there testing eyes. I was in a room of the, of the ward, and I was testing, um, uh, I was testing inmates' eyes. And across the courtyard, there was a group of, um, uh, of prisoners just singing, singing like you would not believe. All right. And then a, a bell went in the other side of the courtyard, and it was um, time for the breakfast or something like this, they are, a, a lot of them lined up with metal plates and sitting on their haunches, all sort of, you know, very inhumane looking. And I had the contrast between that and the, and the singing, which was quite uplifting. And in a moment, it was tears of, I can't, I can't get that difference around. It was, it was just difficult. A week later, I'd flown down to Rwanda, and there I was sitting in a um, in a hotel, feet of hot chocolate in one hand and some food, and I can't get that difference that I'd seen out of my head. I still can't. I'd go back in a heartbeat. Don't, don't get me wrong, because it was very rewarding work. In fact, I met a, an Ethiopian prisoner there. This was in Zambia, and um, I was able to use my uh, the only phrase I know in Ethiopian or Amharic, which is "fitla fit tamal keche," which means "look straight ahead." <laughs> <laughs> every time you do this, they go, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there's, there's there's little moments there, but that's the thing that that's the profound thing. The travel is important. You can see and read about and um, and hear about these things but the true way of knowing what it's all about is to go in there and immerse yourself and immersion is the right word and that's what different travel and that's what the action and the vision there to do you can uh, immerse yourself and in doing so you can make a difference and make that connection really make that connection absolutely it's the immersion that really oh. got me in Cambodia because we were working on the school but like you say the kids were running around us all the time the village was a stone's throw away there were just people there all the time and you you feel part of that community for that short time you're there but then also seeing the long-term effects of it afterwards um, you, yeah. know, you, make, you make friends on these trips from over there and you keep in touch I'm still in touch with all the guys in Nepal all the guys in Cambodia yeah. and it, it's just it's the global family really and oh well, yeah that, I agree with that and um I remember Jill, we went and walked in Cambodia, we, went, we walked down to the village, the um, have a look around, um, and we stopped at a, a little house, and the lady was in there making, making like pancakes, sweet pancakes thing, weren't you? And yeah. We were, yeah. Of, we were all looking fascinated by it, and you're yeah. in a situation there where if you can uh, make enough for everybody up there, we'll be able to, and that was a great way of, of, of helping the local people there, you know. Financially, in a sense, yeah. never, never, never be able to get any other way. But we, we, you see things that tourists, if you're a tourist, 
which you'd never you'd never get to see because you build up they you build up a trust between you within that very short period of time you've come there to help and their kids are coming to the school and there's a trust there that you could never develop as a tourist you know just coming and looking at these things and yeah we get invited into their homes they cook things for you it's it's an amazing relationship it forms so quickly yeah. something that i i just want to add in there you were talking about relationships not just with the community but also with your fellow teammates um since we've been talking we have been inundated with well wishes and comments i'm just going to read some of those to you now and let you know who's been watching so um goodness me we've got quite a lot oh sorry let me just yeah, we're all ticking off that box. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you can stick your thumbs up and <laughs> do some oh, there are. <laughs> So we've got um, Elaine Ashmore with us. Um, she wishes us good morning. Steve Richens, um, Sue Holloway is there. Daula uh, Sherpa from oh, Nepal has joined me. us. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Featherstone comments, oh, fantastic work, Alan. Uh, your passion is contagious. Keep safe so you can carry on with this brilliant cause. So it's a, a lovely thing. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Tony Elliott has joined us as well. Great to see you as well, uh, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Um, Jeanette Gill is here with us as well, um, as is Ooh. Rob Holmes. Um, Rob mentioned that uh, you were brilliant in now. Cambodia. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots more. I'm going to keep going. Um, Keith Everington is here, um, wishing wishing as well. Um, Natty Keith, Tucker. Look at the trousers, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Natty Tucker has joined us as well, um, wishing us all the best. Shirley Metcalf. Um, Tracy Jago from Will and Hospice has joined us as well. Thanks, Tracy. And um, Trevor from Leicester is with us. Um, Rob Holmes uh, made a comment earlier on when you were talking about the gorillas and their flatulence. He asked, are you sure that it was the gorilla, was his question. So. He wasn't there, he doesn't know. There we go. <laughs> he also comments that, um, that, Alan, he loves your enthusiasm and passion for the work. Um, and, you know, also Rob mentioned that... Um, uh, Rubia, you owned that playground, is what he said. Um, you know, the work that you did there was incredible. Um, just a few more. Jeanette uh, has said that she has so many shared memories with you, and it's lovely to listen to you all talking about these memories that you've shared together. Um, Sue Vet is here with us as well, um, who mentions about <laughs> coconuts and mangoes um, and the, the wonderful fresh fruit um, there in Cambodia. And Steve mentions that it brings it all back. Um, it's lovely times. Um, Anna has just commented, Anna Nicol, so many returning travellers, um, and you're right, you know, it's one of those things that you you experience this, you know, often as strangers and you come together, like you said, Alan, you know, you meet 20-something people at the airport, possibly for the first time ever, and after just a short period of time, you make these incredible bonds with each other and, you know, you become friends for life and um, it's an experience that you share which people don't necessarily understand to the depth at which you've experienced it you know it's you can explain it like you have so eloquently yeah. um, but to actually be there and to feel it and to to share those magical experiences that's something that is so special and kind of keeps you bonded for life um, it, it, you're right it's something you can't explain the only and it is the only way to um, understand it is to participate mm. that's it Absolutely. So tell us, what is your next trip? Where are you off to next with, uh, with different travel? Cambodia. Um, yes, Cambodia. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, I think it's in the school. Um, and I also will get the chance to um, meet up with Srivina, who is a, a, a child I sponsor out there. When we went in 2016, mm -hmm. 2016, uh, we had such a, a, a lot of us had such a, a moving time there that we uh, all contacted um, ActionAid and um, we started sponsoring some children in, in Campot. So um, it, it was just a magical time there. And so the, the hope is to uh, dip out there and be able to see Trevino and her family. I sent her some uh, letters, this is what we do, and um, there's some uh, pictures of what we've done in Rwanda, um, is that the other? And she sent me a letter back 
say, I love the colors of Rwanda, I love the colors and all this. And so you got that connection there. So um, a school we built in Cambodia, um, and that's going to be fantastic. I mean, it's just going to be great. Mm, can't <laughs> and wait. That's a and fantastic. Whoever hasn't been on one of these trips before, you know what you need to do now. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're selling anything here. <laughs> no, 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 no. But if you want a life, you, it's true. If you want a life-changing experience and uh, yeah, and then memories that will last forever, then join us. Mm. If not this year, next year. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you can't understand what no. the experience is like until you've actually experienced it yourself. And like you say. Cambodia was quite emotional for a lot of us and I just remember coming back to the building site in floods of tears and everyone when, understood it was when I got back from uh, seeing the first experience when I got back from seeing Carla midway through the building Mozambique it was lunchtime and all the group was a group was sitting around waiting uh, sorry, just eating away. And I got back and uh, he goes, oh, how long was your trip and all this? So I said, to see Carla. So I put myself down and everybody's looking around and watching me. And I got oh, three quarters of the way through <laughs> before, you know, <laughs> it's that powerful an experience. All right? It doesn't mean you have to have a, a sponsored child there, but it is a powerful experience. Remember, Joe, we went round the hospital and we saw all the children being vaccinated. Mm. What a, you know, yeah. sort of experience. Mm. Definitely. So, what, what places have you been dreaming about while we're all being stuck at home, Ali? Uh, I want to go back to Egypt, uh, Lickety Split. I've been to Egypt about six times, but only to Luxor and use that as a base because I've got a fascination with hieroglyphics and ancient Egyptian history. But there is something to be said about uh, looking across the West Bank as the sun goes down behind, behind the hills there. It is, there's an energy there. And if I don't know if any of you guys have done it, but if you go to Karnak and do the tour at night, I was fortunate to be able to go there. I've been there a few times, but when it was a full moon and when Karnak is lit by an artificial light, but just the moon, oh. you're walking through there. I hung back from the, the tour group that was going through and I, and it was just forget it was just me and all the history that was there. Oh. And I've been thinking about India because um, because Jill says it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it does look it it is. wonderful and it is. So, if you could go on an adventure, Alan, yeah. with, with three people, past, present, or fictional, who would you, who would they be, and why? Miriam Margolis, you know the lady. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, uh, yeah, because she's yeah. eccentric and she wears a hat and a sleeve. And I was fortunate in uh, November or December of last year, so just a few months ago, she came to Morton and was uh, doing a talk on Dickens, which is an actor, of course. Uh, but I remember seeing her in the real Marigold Hotel and seeing the passion she has with people. So definitely mm. her. In fact, during the, at the end of the talk, I went up to her and said, look, you're going to come with us to, because I know she supports acting in anyway, but are you going to come with us to uh, one of these trips? Because you're such a such a, a person, and she went, I'm fast to be able to do that now. <laughs> anyway, so Miriam would be <laughs> the second one. I think would be um, uh, Maya Angelou, the the um, the rights worker. You uh, see, she's not with us anymore, and the poet and the writer. Um, because I saw a program of her a few years ago. It was on the BBC. Uh, what an inspiration! What a person! And what a writer! And all the things she's done for women and girls and the, and the civil rights movement in America, it would just be, there's not many people who I'd look up to and say, yes, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And that's and that. But she was one of them. So I heard. I, I, and as for the third, I was thinking about taking somebody along who, um, who would benefit greatly from an <laughs> experience. Um, you know, People who <laughs> people who could benefit from it. So we're up, so 
point any fingers or anything, but maybe the sort of uh, fridge magnet who runs America. That's a that's one. But no, but I, I changed my mind. And so what I would do, um, it would be young people. I, I've always wanted to take my niece and nephew with me mm. uh, because it, it would get an experience. But um, if I if I'd have done this when I wasn't as old as I am now, it would it would change my life and maybe move in a different direction. But I think. Yeah, uh, any the young younger generation to open their eyes to see what's beyond the screen, the end of the garden, the village, the town, the city. You know, open up their eyes to that. And in fact, by by chance, there's an example of that. For you know, that I can talk about in in Kenya, where we came back from in December. Um, there was a a, a mum and her daughter who. Um, who were, is their first experience? When they had such a, a wonderful time that when they got back to the UK, the daughter, I won't mention her name, but she knows that she is. She's a fantastic ballerina, by the way. And she was at college, and um, it wasn't for her. And um, the experience had changed her so much that she dropped out of college and started working in childcare, and then did I mean, straight away jumped off and did five weeks in Ghana working with the Children's Relief um, NGO. So it made a difference to someone of her age as well. So that's inspirational. That's well worth um, uh, talking about. So something I just wanted to to add in there, um, which I thought would be quite important to address. And this isn't something that we've kind of pre-discussed. So I'm sorry if I'm throwing something a bit random at you. Um, you obviously mentioned about having the opportunity to see the way that people live um, in these different countries and things. And I think um, sometimes people are a bit concerned about this kind of trip because they think of it as sort of this privileged voyeurism kind of trip where you're, you're sort of looking at someone's life and, and not really doing anything but kind of just observing. Um, but the argument to that, I mean, certainly that we, we, the way that we feel is that it's not about voyeurism, it's about sharing the world and it's about um, being able to experience that and to get a different perspective on things. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Rob, uh, who's an who's a, um, engineer, uh, along with Anthony, who helps us with these as well, um, he says, we don't work for, we work with. So it's, and, and, I, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and, that, and that makes a difference. I mean, it, it makes this point every single time, and it's absolutely right. I don't see, um, you know, my Andrew wrote of the human family, where we are, um, so the, the words in that speak volumes, okay? We are more alike than we are underlined, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was in uh, Nepal uh, at lunchtime, I went for a wander down to the village by myself. And while I was down there, I saw everybody in there sort of waving, are you working up there? Yes, I'm working on And they were all very accepting. There's a little lady there working on a loom, and we shared a, uh, we didn't share a mint, but I gave her one of my mints. <laughs> um, but I thought, I, I, on reflection, I looked back and I thought, what would happen if I was working in my garden and uh, a, a group of people walked by and wanted to take pictures of me gardening? I would think, well, that, that would be a bit weird, a bit strange, wouldn't you, really? But um, so, I, so he's walking in somebody else's shoes to understand their perspective of, of what we're doing. But we were working with, um, like um, Rivia said beforehand, we make relationships. This is not a, and there are situations, quite rightly, Lexi, where you will see um, people going on holiday and they do this um, sort of um, poverty tourism thing where they always go and say, oh, isn't it terrible like this? Well, then. Take your shot, get in, get in there, get some word, and then make a difference. You know, get us bit and, and do it. The projects that we do are needed and sourced from uh, local people within the community. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so it is a, a need, and we, are, I'm happy to go and help anywhere. So yeah, yeah, I can understand the, the perspective of that, but uh, we work with our fellow uh, humans. For want of a better expression, rather than for, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think it's important to say on the project, um, it's not a case of a big group of Westerners going in and doing this build and then leaving it. You're very much working alongside local builders and tradesmen. We're not taking away anything from their economy. They work alongside you, and then once you go, that work carries on for them. And 
you get to see the finished results as well because of the relationships you, you make. Um, you don't need any experience to go and then you learn how to be a bookie while you're there. Yeah, but it, it is very much working, at, like especially on the playground, I was working one-on-one -on -one with a Cambodian builder who had limited English, but that didn't matter. We yeah. managed to, to work together and, and get it done. And I think that's quite important to say it is, like you say, you're, you're working for them. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We've had um, a few more comments um, on the Facebook there uh, since we've been chatting and uh, Rob Holmes has mentioned something which I think is really nice. We serve, we don't help. And I think that's a really lovely way of putting it. Um, thanks for your contribution there, Rob. Um, I had another few comments as well, um, people sharing their memories. Um, Jude Dixon mentions that uh, being in Vietnam with St. Margaret's Hospice where she was invited and the group were invited to join a family wedding uh, throughout the trip, which is a really wonderful experience and having that opportunity to kind of be part Part of the community and not just an outsider looking in. Um, Rob also mentioned that the team of volunteers that join this kind of adventure, it's that makes it part of the experience in itself. Um, Jeanette mentions that she hopes um, that her travel will be, uh, restrictions will be lifted by November because she's very much looking forward to, to returning to Cambodia and hopefully meeting her sponsored child as well. Um, Anna Nicol also kind of reflected that um, sentiment as well. Um, we've got a hi to Jill from Joe Gray. Um, hi there, Joe. Thanks for joining us. Um, and it's just wonderful to see so many people reminiscing about these experiences. And thank you so much, Alan, for taking the time to chat about this with us. Um, you know, it's it's so nice to hear your perspective as someone that's done this so many times. And um, we're just very grateful to have you as kind of one of these amazing people that supports the communities um, on such a regular basis. So thank you so much for your contribution. And also um, Jill and Rubia, you know, you've been there on the ground as well and kind of done the, the hard work as well. So you know, thank you so much for, for supporting the communities in this way. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining in. Gave me, gave me shivers to hear all your names again. <laughs> Well, um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, we've been chatting for almost 40 minutes, would you believe? Um, it's been such a wonderful conversation. So um, we're going to say goodbye for now. And uh, if you've got any questions that you um, want to point to us or to, to Alan about his experiences, please feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, don't forget to, to like and share the video afterwards so people can learn a little bit more about what it's all about. And we hope that you'll join us next week um, where we'll be talking about a, a different subject about uh, high altitude uh, trekking and uh, experiences up high. Um, thanks again for everyone to joining us and um, we'll see you again next time. Bye. Bye.